$600 for the features listed, you think, man, eh, it's a little steep, but maybe it's worth it. Then you see that aggressive R1000 curve, and you think to yourself, well, I have something else that performs really well that has a savage bend in it, so maybe this will be the same. Two days later, you get a freakishly tall box, you open that sucker up, there's some styrofoam in there. You got a couple of little plastic stands that you don't even take out of their packaging because, well, they're the cheapest, chintziest stands you've ever seen in the world. Then you start running some in-depth benchmarks, and you discover... Well, this is advertised for HDR10, but but it's physically impossible for this display to hit HDR because, well, it doesn't have the needs of brightness, it doesn't have a wide color gamut, and it literally has no hardware required for HDR. Then you're left scratching your head or your tuchus, hovering around the refund button on Amazon, wondering if you should go to the competitors from MSI and Gigabyte. This monitor is by no means terrible, but if you do pull its criminal record, you are going to see quite a rap sheet of flaws, cons, or areas of improvement for their next version or iteration of this monitor. Let's get it. So first of all, Stallions, looking at the specs and the price, this does retail for $600. I did buy it on July 9th for around $580, including tax. It was on a slight sale. There are two very similar competitors. You have the uh, MSI and Gigabyte offerings, which are both closer to the $400 mark, not $600. It does have 165 hertz refresh rate, while the other two that I mentioned do sport 144 hertz. And it does, of course, have AMD FreeSync. And as it is an ultra-wide display, it is 3440 by 1440. Now, this is a fun little marketing gimmick here. Truly realistic HDR. This does not have high dynamic range. It says right here it has HDR10. The lie detector test has shown that is a lie. Now let's get the pros out of the way because unfortunately there are less of those than there are cons. Now this is not a terrible monitor by any stretch of the imagination. And for some people, for a fair amount of people, I would say for their specific uses, the $600 price point is warranted. Let's get right into the pros. And the first one would be the curve. It is a 1000R versus the more common 1500 or 2000R that you will find in curved monitors. So it really wraps around you, but it's not overpowering. The only thing I will say that was a little bit off or wonky for me were your notification and your time and date are, it looked like it was almost tilting away from me, but you don't get that sensation on the bottom left hand side of the screen where you have your Windows start icon. So very interesting. Another pro, it does work with all standard vase amounts. You don't need some kind of weird adapter or anything like that. The 165 Hertz refresh rate is fantastic. And the one millisecond response time is also good in comparison to the 144 Hertz and one millisecond response time offered by its competitors. The contrast ratio is actually very good, trumping most IPS displays. All right, now let's get into the cons. The HDR simply isn't real. It is a marketing gimmick. There is no hardware on board to support high dynamic range and the color response and max brightness do not allow HDR to even be a thing. The brightness isn't high enough in neats and there's no local dimming behind that panel. It just doesn't have a wide color gamut either. Because of these issues, it actually looks worse when running any kind of game or application in an HDR mode. So just stick to SDR or standard dynamic range. The plastic stand is also absolutely atrocious. It feels incredibly flimsy and it only provides tilt and it doesn't even do that very well. So very little adjustability and it just feels like the build quality is non-existent. The next one is the front intake vents. They're strictly cosmetic, but to me, they just look incredibly ugly and cheap, like they're kind of tacked onto the bottom. And the visible bezels around the outside of the display when the monitor are on are a little bit chunky for my liking. The next con is that it really doesn't seem like this is the new panel technology, like what we've seen in the G7 or higher lines. And of course, that is to be expected as this is their mid-range monitor. However, $600 is $200 more than the competitors that offer very, very similar, if not better in some categories, performance. So it'd be nice if they were using at least some of the features of their G7 line. The next con, dark level smearing. I didn't notice it too often, but when I was looking for it for the purpose of this review, trying to critique it as a content creator, I noticed quite a bit of it. Dark grays and blacks do melt together, especially when there is fast motion on screen. Response time was averaging around 10 milliseconds, which is far off from the one millisecond that was advertised. And when you have adaptive FreeSync on, there is a fair amount of input lag, which is most unfortunate. These flaws are more pronounced at a higher frame rate as well. Very minimal, basically non-existent around 100 or 120 hertz, but they start showing their ugly rear around 144 hertz. And at the maximum cap of 165 hertz, it's quite obvious, especially in demanding scenes which is very unfortunate because one of the major selling factors or pros of this monitor is the fact it does have 165 hertz versus the competitor's 144. However, when you crank up that refresh rate, you're seeing a reduced response time and a lot of input lag and that dark level smearing 
gets amplified as well. Max brightness is around 230 nits, which is actually higher than what Samsung had advertised. However, it looks incredibly washed out when you crank up the brightness. So I had the brightness cranked up pretty much to 100% for testing because it looked rather dim to me. And when you do crank it up, it's still dim at 100%, but it's dim and washed out. It just, the brightness is not there. So what is the final verdict? Well, I would honestly look at some of the offerings from Gigabyte and MSI, which are cheaper and do perform better in a lot of the categories. Now, I do greatly like the Curve, the R1000, I think looks fantastic, especially if you sit relatively close to your monitor up against your desk like I do ergonomically when I'm playing or streaming. But shit, it didn't look that great to me. Um, and that is a combination of, well, the inky blacks actually blending together with a lot of the dark grays. And when I like to target 165 hertz with free sync on, which is the ideal way to play this monitor, it introduces input lag and just a bunch of unsavory characteristics of the image on screen. Also, it's relatively expensive for what they're offering. If they were to drop the price about $100, include a better stand out of the box, which for me personally, I didn't even take it out of its plastic wrap. My friend has this exact monitor. I know what the stand looks and feels like. I've messed around with it. It has virtually no adjustability and it feels incredibly cheap. I immediately slapped it on a vase amount and mounted it to my wall. So if they were to include a better stand, reduce the price about 100% and include just a couple of the features from the G7 line, this would be my go-to ultra wide. But until then, unfortunately, Stallions, there are better options in the ultra wide market. If you Stallions enjoyed this video, liking it will help it to get seen by more people that might be potentially in the market for an ultra wide monitor. So this review can assist them as well. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, as well as tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing and honest peripheral reviews like this one. If you'd like to become a member of Gamer Heaven, there is a join button below that will unlock a sweet set of perks. There is a merch store down there as well. And I will see you guys in the next video, which shall be tomorrow because I upload daily.